Hi, I'm Robert Wright. I run the Non-Zero Foundation, which produces The Glenn Show and all other shows on Blogging Heads TV and Meaning of Life TV. We host a variety of voices, some of them highly unorthodox, and we encourage dialogue that is sharp but civil. We think fostering constructive conversation is especially important now that America, and even the world, is looking kind of fragile. If you agree that our mission is important, I hope you'll consider helping us shoulder the cost. You can do that by becoming one of our cherished patrons at patreon.com slash nonzero foundation. That's N-O-N-Z-E-R-O-F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N. Thanks. We need your help, and we deeply appreciate it. Hello, Peter. How are you? Uh, doing all right. It's cr- crazy times. I'm here with Peter Asidiakano. He's professor of economics at Duke. I'm Glenn Lowry. This is the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv, uh, sponsored by the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown, where I'm a professor. Peter is a labor economist, an applied microeconomist. Uh, he's interested in education, discrimination. He's done some important work. He's also uh, served as an expert um, consultant with the plaintiffs in the Harvard uh, Asian Student Affirmative Action case, about which I want to talk to him. He's a, a prominent uh, uh, Peter. What are dynamic, discrete choice models, man? I heard, understand you're trying to estimate them. Uh, he, he, he's out there on the technical side in the Journal of Econometrics and whatnot. Uh, with his research and uh, has been uh, uh, someone I've known for a while and uh, I admire and appreciate. So I'm glad to have him on the Glenn Show for a conversation about economics, research, affirmative action, uh, race, stuff like that. Hey, Peter. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Did I, did I leave anything out? Any awards or accomplishments? <laughs> that- <laughs> no, that's totally fine. <laughs> I'm serious about that uh, estimating the, the, the dynamic discrete choice models. What what's the application there? Well, it actually started with thinking about higher education and thinking about how people make decisions. So um, you get to college, you have some idea about um, what your strengths are in terms of different majors, and uh, then you make a decision about what major you're going to study with expectations that you might change your mind. Uh, And so that's where the dynamic discrete choice comes in is that you're making these decisions repeatedly with an eye always towards the future. So you might choose a hard major to start relatively hard major to start with, with, because that's going to give you the option value of sort of pursuing that, that in the future. Okay. Um, and of course, that's what led to me getting into some trouble later on in terms of my uh, work on choice in nature. Okay, so there's the application, and then there's the general theory. We're interested in the application. What kinds of majors do students choose? And you got into trouble about that. I, I want to hear about that. But first of all, about the theory. So, what what are the novel econometric problems introduced? when you're trying to look at data in a dynamic discrete choice setting? Yeah, so the big thing is characterizing people's expectations about the future. So I'm making a decision today knowing that uh, it's an uncertain environment, so I'm going to get some new information in the future, both about you know how much I'm going to like this particular major, but also maybe realizations about my grades, those types of things. And so it's that all that stuff we did in macro with solving those backwards recursion problems, we're going to be doing that uh, now. And the, except it's just discrete decisions, you know. So we've got value functions there uh, associated with the value of choosing this major today. Uh, how that's going to affect my earnings in the future and so on. Now, I assume that the decision maker is going to have information as they're uh, going through this dynamic process that's not available to the econometrician in whatever your data set is. So that that's going to probably also be an issue, no? That's right. And so actually that's where some of my contribution has been on how to estimate those models when uh, what we call it is unobserved heterogeneity where they have some private information that's not observed to the researcher. 
but somewhat gets revealed through the decisions that they make and the things that happen to them. So you see somebody and they persistently get high grades above and beyond what the rest of their characteristics might predict. That's going to provide some of that, that information. Um, or they seem to be choosing these majors despite the fact that the fit doesn't seem so good. Uh, but they persistently do that. That's going to help you sort of tease out uh, the role of those unobserved tastes. Okay. Now, the area you say you got into trouble, the uh, particular application was about whether kids who elect to take uh, STEM-related majors persist in that decision through the course of their college careers. And you were finding that, if I recall this correctly, there was a racial disparity with the black kids being more likely to leave the STEM having initially declared, but that that disparity was entirely accounted for by differences in the entry-level test scores of the students. The black students who might have been admitted with lower test scores were more likely to leave, but the ones who had the same test score performance as the white students were no more likely to leave STEM. Am am I correct in my summary of that research? That's right. Uh, That once you account for... um the characteristics of the individual. And these characteristics are things that were affected by their past educational experiences. So no way do I think this should be interpreted in any sense as genetic or anything of the sort. But when you come in with differences in academic background, that has particular bite in the sciences. How is that measured? Uh, Is it the SAT, ACT score, or the high school uh... Curriculum, how, how is that measured? So certainly test scores are part of that. Uh, in this case, we actually had Duke's uh, rankings of the applicants on various measures. Uh, but what's nice is even then you don't really have to use those particular measures. You could just use um, how well they did in their first year courses. Uh, and that too would point towards no uh, racial differences. Um, so to me, the paper was not about um, uh, race. Race plays a role because they're coming in with different uh, academic backgrounds. How big were the uh, the gross racial difference in the uh, uh, attrition rate of students initially indicating interest in STEM who ended up leaving? Yeah, so this, we counted economics as part of STEM in this case, uh, but for it was particularly stark among males. So for white males, um, 8% were leaving STEM. For African-American males, it was uh, over 50%. Did you say 50? Over 50, yes. Wow. Yeah, huge, huge differences. and, so and all of that can be can accounted for, for by diff- excuse me all Sorry. of that difference between the 50% and the 8% could be explained by taking into account the preparation of the students for the STEM courses That's right And, and uh you could see it I mean Asian Americans uh were even more likely to persist uh and again you see these big racial gaps um, unconditionally, and once you condition on uh, the, the, the different academic backgrounds, all that goes away. Oh, so the Asian higher persistence in the STEM is also accounted for by their um, more favorable uh, backgrounds going in uh, in, in the first place. That's right. Now, why is this controversial, man? It sounds like this is useful information. So um, I think it's, it became controversial because somebody cited it in an amicus brief um, in the Fisher case on more what was perceived as more of the anti-affirmative action side. I was not involved with that. It got written, my article got written up in the Chronicle of Higher Education, and then somebody found out about it at Duke and I think told people they should be upset by it. I think what was the the potentially negative press headline said, uh, potentially racist studies as black students are taking the easy way out. Um, 
And I think it was interpreted as saying, and this this really gets back to I think the core issue we're facing in society <laughs> is uh, it was interpreted as I was blaming the victim. And uh, for the fact that they were coming in with with worse academic backgrounds, which is something that didn't really even occur to me at the time that it could be interpreted that way, that they're somehow inferior because they're coming in with these different academic backgrounds. I think that that does an incredible injustice to, uh, well, first of all, I think that's just a problem. We shouldn't have to label differences in preparation coming in as some sort of judgment of the individual. We ought to be looking to uh, get everybody on the same page so that they can they can persist. Uh, so yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that for the moment. Well, let me let me imagine what I think a pushback here would be. You are assuming when you see the attrition rate uh, being what it is that the student, your, your production function of what happens when students go in and when they, they come out either uh, persisting and better educated or not, is that the variation in student ability, however measured, is what accounts for the difference in the outcome. But what about the institution itself? How are these classes organized and taught? What's the nature of the pedagogy? If the institutions, if the people who are trying to teach STEM were more uh, accommodating of the diversity of the backgrounds of the students who are coming in, rather than all the smart white kids sitting in the front and the teacher looking at them and teaching right to them where the black kids are isolated in the back of the class somewhere, or rather than the motivations for the subject matter being dry and uh, uninspiring, rather than drawing on some of the cultural resonance of the people who are new to this kind of environment, or those people don't feel comfortable. They look around, they don't see anybody who looks like them. The professors don't look like them, et cetera, okay? You know how this argument is yeah. gonna go. So, you know, you're just basically saying, the kids had low scores and we know these tests are biased and they don't, you know, you know how, you know how the argument is gonna go. Uh, they've got a different theory about what's going on inside the classroom. And they're not freighting it so much on the student's ability as they are on the, structure that is in is in common. So what do you what would you say to that? Well, I mean, I found it remarkable that it explained it all for exactly the reasons that you mentioned. So you would have thought that perhaps that would, uh, uh, to the extent that inclusion sec, uh, matters, that that would work against those findings. And yet, remarkably, it, it uh, accounts for it. Wait a minute, I'm, um, not ex I'm, not, I'm not understanding this. So, I mean, I was surprised that uh, it accounted for everything. What, uh, what is it? I'm sorry. Oh, the, the difference is in academic background because it actually doesn't leave a lot of room for some of those other things. Now, what it does leave room for is how the, the majors are structured in terms of how much certain, it's more of a disparate impact. Okay, okay. Story. And so then what you see, is, you know, Valen Johnson wrote a book called Great Inflation, A Crisis in a Higher Education. Um, I'm, I'm, there are no easy majors at Duke, but some majors are definitely harder than others. And you can see that because the majors that have the highest grades also have the lowest study types. So, and that creates a sorting um, within colleges where those who come in more prepared are more likely to be in the sciences you know, some of it, there's still comparative advantage, too. I mean, if you're better at the verbal stuff than at the math, then that's going to shift you around a bit um, as well. But there is this sorting that happens where um, there are plenty of students in economics, so we don't have to worry about um, giving low grades. I mean, we might have too many students from the perspective of the university. Whereas in other departments... They don't have you guys give students. C's. You guys give C's. Some C's for sure, certainly in those intro, intro classes. Whereas in other departments where um, there isn't as much innate demand, they're not doing that, and those C's disproportionately are going to land on students who are coming in less prepared. If everybody gets an A, preparation doesn't matter. So. 
What, what would you say to the following uh, speculation? Um, I want diversity in my institution, which is selective. Okay. I'm Duke and we're talking chemistry or physics. I want diversity. Um, I, I want racial diversity. I, I face the reality of populations that are uh, distinct in terms of their preparation. So there's a disadvantage. So the students of color are a disadvantaged population in the sense that the distribution of preparation is less favorable as compared to, let's say, the Asian or the, uh, the Caucasian students population. These are population statements, not individual statements that I'm making. But from the institution's point of view, I want diversity. And I know, as a matter of fact, going in, that I've got these distinct populations. So now, it seems to me that there's a there's a number of different margins here. And I'm asking, you know, your professional opinion about how you think about this way of thinking about the problem. One of them is that I can simply, at the level of the individual student, be less selective for the group that is disadvantaged. I have a lower threshold. So they are going to be on average and at the margin less prepared uh, than the advantaged group of students, but that's in the interest of the objective of getting more diversity in the institution. That's one way to go about it. But another way to go about it is basically to make what happens when you get to the institution less dependent for its uh, uh, outcome on the degree of preparation of the student coming in. You know, one way of putting this crudely would be I can water down the curriculum. I can dumb it down. I can slow down the pace. I can flatten it. Okay. I can be less hierarchical in terms of, you know, uh, how I structure what's going to happen after the kid gets in. Um, I can get rid of requirements. Uh, I can ease up on grading differentiation so that I don't expose the fact of the populations coming in with different preparation in the first place. Now, I think most of the debate about affirmative action has been on the first margin, on the margin of the selection of the students and whether or not the criteria of preparation are equally applied across the different population groups. But I think that the long-term institutional consequences of affirmative action may turn much more on this second margin that I'm talking about, how we organize ourselves. Because I think that's not only issues of selection, it's also issues of like values of, you know, let me give the, and I'll stop because I'm going on for yeah. a while. Let me give the example of economics. A lot of people will say it's too mathematical. Okay, you and I are both, are you a fellow of the Econometric Society? Yeah. I was about to say, if that's not true, that's a, that's a criminal <laughs> offense and somebody ought to see to it right away. But, and so am I. And, and so, I mean, we know that math is a good thing. We like econometrics. We, you know, we understand the power of the techniques and whatnot like that. But somebody might come along and say, if you weren't so mathematical, you would have more students of color who would get PhDs in economics and, and uh, it would be a different kind of thing. So now you're not talking about somebody's uh, 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 G, uh, GRE score. You're talking about how you actually, you know, uh, define what constitutes excellence that you're using to discriminate between the practitioners of the of the field and you're trying to identify the, the very best and you're kind of flattening it. You're kind of making it less uh, de less dependent upon the individual practitioners doing a certain kind of, in this case, mathematical uh, uh, thing very well. So I don't know. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's definitely where we're headed. I mean, at the, at the time that I wrote the paper, I think part of the criticism was is that I didn't emphasize that channel, but was more about, you know, we, we should try to get, uh, do things to get these students uh, prepared. Um, but now I think things have shifted. I think it's moved more towards uh, we need to change the way the curriculum structured, uh, both at the PhD level and at the undergraduate level. Are you talking about the economics way I've heard in it explained particular? To me, in economics in particular. Mm -hmm, okay. and, and the way I've heard it explained is that, yes, that, that fun, I mean, it gets back to what you see in a, a book like How to Be an Anti-Racist, which is that equality of outcomes is sort of the, the goal. Uh, and in that case, um, 
you're going to have to do to 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 really change things in order in order to get there. Um, which I, you know, I think goes too far. Um, we can do things at the margin, but uh, I, I, I think that we shouldn't be changing the way um, what counts constitutes as quality just to agree, achieve a particular demographic composition. If we're missing out on certain ideas uh, because of how the system is structured, then I think there's a better argument. Um, but just to uh, have equality of outcomes itself along these particular dimensions, um, I find that a little it makes me more nervous. It makes you it makes you somewhat conservative with a small C. Uh, you know, it, it makes you kind of wanting to hold on to a kind of received and traditional way of making gradations and judgments and discriminations over and against the more kind of uh, subversive and, and radical uh, critique. I mean, you know, uh, or or does it? I mean, do you disagree with that? Well, so what makes me nervous about it is does it introduce a political element that ends up being reinforced in the, the research? I mean, sort of to bring it back to the Harvard case. Um, yeah, which we haven't really talked about, but go ahead. You know, to me, in that Harvard case, the evidence of Asian discrimination was as good as you're ever going to find. Like, it was overwhelming. Uh, and, you know, you agreed. <laughs> they said, to, you know, you signed the brief uh, supporting our yeah. side. But the other side, the fact that they found those incredibly high profile economists to, in my mind, deny basic tenets of, uh, you know, how we do empirical work, that, that was scary, you know, because that says that fundamentally, we already know what the right answer is, uh, that our, our uh, discipline is there to serve a particular agenda, as opposed to being interested in, in seeking the truth. Um, let me explain a little bit to people who might not be following this closely. So uh, this is the Student for Fair Admissions in uh, uh, Harvard University, largely Asian American students who were suing the university for discrimination in a, a practice of affirmative action against Asian American applicants. And uh, Peter served as a lead uh, expert witness for the plaintiffs in the lawsuit and there were a prominent economist, David Card of UC Berkeley, I suppose would be the most prominent of them uh, serving on the other side of this. Uh, a brief uh, on behalf of the plaintiffs was developed and some uh, economist experts such as myself were solicited to see if we would support the brief. And I did indeed sign on because I did indeed agree with the conclusion that you just summarized, which was that the evidence of discrimination against Asians was overwhelming. You're the expert, I won't try to summarize the evidence but I can remember one table in particular, which had applicants over a series of years broken down by deciles and then broken out by uh, ethnic group. And you could look at, in terms of the decile of the academic index presented by the applicant, where the Asian students, the white students, the black students fell, okay, that more than half of the black students were in the bottom two deciles of applicants over this period of time. The Asian students were clustered at the top of the applicants. But when you look at decile specific admission rates, you would see huge difference. I mean, by a factor of 10 or eight or six between the rate at which, given the decile of academic index of the student, the Asian students were disadvantaged in the rate at which they were being admitted. Now, that was not a definitive thing, but it was something that made your, you know, your eyes would pop out. You would say if you're a black kid and you're in the seventh decile, or the sixth is, oh, you still got a 30 or 40% chance of getting in. If you're an Asian kid, your chance of getting in is like zero. It's like 3% or something like that. Um, in the end, but, but there was a lot of evidence uh, to the effect that the Asian students were discriminated against. There was an argument on the other side, Peter, I'm sure you can uh, recite it as well as I. And it was that the test scores are not the only thing that we're interested in when we make these selections. There are other ineffable qualities that we discern by our various uh, methods of uh, assessing the whole application. 
uh, which unfortunately work to the detriment of the Asians on the average, uh, et cetera. What, 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 right. uh, did, what, what did you have to say to that? So um, we account for almost all those measures. Uh, and I should also distinguish what, what really bothered me about that brief was not, is we, the way you introduced it there, you brought up what's going on with black students. But the discrimination part was really just relative to white students. And that's what made the brief particularly offensive to me. Like if, if they write a brief that made a principled defense of affirmative action and why these things are, I w it wouldn't have bothered me so much. What bothers me is it was only about the Asian versus white students and then saying, look, um, these Asian American students just must have worse, uh, they're scoring worse on the personal score. You need that. So Harvard, let me back up, Harvard rates you on a number of things. Uh, Harvard basically argued that Asian Americans weren't as multidimensional as whites. And that's based on four ratings that Harvard has. One of those is the academic rating, where Asian Americans do much better than whites. The extracurricular rating, where Asians again do better than whites. The two ratings where Asian Americans do poorly uh, are the two that when the Office of Civil Rights investigate Harvard were the most subjective. And that was the athletic rating and the personal rating. Uh, so when they say that they're less multidimensional, it's because of those two ratings. Well, the athletic rating, the people who do best on that athletic rating are white legacies. Uh, it's, this is how good you are at Harvard sports. So this is, were you on the sailing team and such? And I control for that in the model, you know, and still find the penalty. On the personal rating side, um, we model the personal rating. We control for everything in there. And CARD has some models too that can, that throws even more stuff in there. And you cannot make that gap go away you see that Asian Americans are scored worse on the personal rating relative to whites, uh, despite their observables suggesting otherwise. So typically in economics, we'll say, look, if you add controls uh, and the gap you know, uh, gets worse, that's sort of telling you there's it's something else going, going on. Now the, the opposite, you know, the fact that race plays a role in the personal rating, you can also see it with African-Americans as well, because African-Americans did extremely well on the personal, on the personal rating. But even then, it was particular African-Americans. So um, if you're a disadvantaged African-American, you don't get near the bump that uh, an advantaged African-American gets. In the personal rating. In both the personal rating and the overall rating and Harvard admissions. That's, a, that's where that shows up. You know, uh, it's remarkable. You get a large bump for being African-American. You get a small bump for being disadvantaged. But if you're a disadvantaged African-American, they're not going to give you that disadvantaged bump. So in the end, you, know, you compare a disadvantaged African-American to a disadvantaged white student, the advantage the African-American gets is gonna be much smaller than, than two advantaged, advantaged kids. Okay, you're saying a couple of things I think should be underscored. One of them is that in the, con in the context of the Asian uh, lawsuit at Harvard, the real issue is Asians being disadvantaged relative to whites, not Asians being disadvantaged relative to blacks, although Blacks do receive some uh, some advantage. Well, there, there are uh, a few issues. I mean, that that was the real issue of the trial and the real issue of the brief. The counter to that will be, look, the guy bringing the lawsuit wants to take down affirmative action. 
That, so there is the issue of racial preferences that did play a role at the trial. And it's certainly the case that the number of seats that Asian Americans lose out on as a result of discrimination relative to white students, that's a substantial amount, but it's much smaller than the number of seats they lose out on due to affirmative action. So the, the brief on the other side is a front to cover for uh, the affirmative action part of the case. But the other thing that you're saying that I wanted to underscore is your concern about integrity of research in the profession and about the politicization of the process. And, you know, uh, David Card is a very well-respected economist and uh, he was your uh, opposite number in this uh, lawsuit. You guys did not agree about what the data showed in this particular case. But you're, you're suggesting that you, 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 and I don't want to personalize this. I'm not, I'm not yeah. asking, you know, you're, you're, you're suggesting that you're concerned that, uh, and uh, the, 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 and, and we're in this moment of heightened sensitivity around racial politics and, and social justice, that you're concerned that that's, that's threatening the integrity of the entire enterprise here of, uh, of, uh, economic research. Um, What's another example of that? Nothing jumps right to mind, but maybe it's just because I'm on the spot. I, I will say <laughs> that my, my issue with, uh, you know, David Card's always been very good to me throughout my career. Um, I've had a good relationship with him, though we, we haven't really had chances to interact since the trial. I understand why Card did what he did. I mean, he's paid expert for Harvard. Um, but what's been interesting is the fallout behind it. I, you know, people can think I'm, I'm not telling the truth on this, but I went in with the intent of, you know, my work's on affirmative action. So I want to understand how these processes, processes work. We've written a number of papers out of my reports. That was always my intent. Where I think it gets crosses the line, I mean, I have much more of an issue with the people who signed the amicus brief on the other side. Is uh, that um, that that well, included some Nobel laureate? It wasn't George Akerlof's name on that list. George Akerlof uh, and Bob Sola were their two Nobel laureates. Now Janet Bob Yellen's my, name was uh, on Bob the was list. my thesis advisor. Excuse me, Bob Sola was my thesis advisor back at MIT all those years ago. I love him. I mean, he's a great man. Yeah. And, and I've heard wonderful things about Akerlof. Um, no, Akerlof, I, I don't we know shouldn't, him. yeah, you know, Akerlof is, is Akerlof. He would agree with me that Bob Solo is Bob Solo. We're all going to pay our respects to Bob Solo. This is an MIT thing. You have to have been there to understand. <laughs> but but here's what Bob must be doing, right? And, and George, Bob Solo, the great Bob Solo, the great George Akerlof, they must be standing on behalf of social justice, they, they, they must be lending their considerable prestige and credibility to uh, the a defense of uh, affirmative action, which is under threat. What's the guy's name? I'm sorry, I don't remember the guy who's uh, funded the SFFA. Ed Bloom. Ed Bloom, yeah, and he's notorious, isn't he? Uh, uh, from that Texas case, uh, wasn't he involved That's in right. that? So this isn't the first time he's, he's filed a case on the affirmative action. Okay, so there's a but. movement. It's anti-affirmative action. It's been going on for decades. It has its uh, mouthpieces, its funding sources, and, and they're standing against that. And they're saying, you know, as I'm sure uh, Bill Bowen, the late, great uh, former president of the Mellon Foundation and uh, president of Princeton University and a labor economist of... Uh, you know, he was a died in the wolf pro affirmative action guy. I actually worked with him in the 90s. You know, I, I wrote a forward uh, uh, introduction to their book, a uh, Bowen and Box book, a paperback edition of The Shape of the River, Defending Affirmative Action and Hiring. You know, these guys are on a mission. They, they're trying to open up. They think Barack and Michelle Obama, they think, you know, they think the whole role of the philanthropic, you know, uh, elite uh, uh, institutions is to try. And they see it as under try to incorporate African Americans more fully into the governance and the hierarchy of the country, and they see it as under threat from the likes of Ed Bloom, and, and so that's what they're doing. Do you, you don't think that's justified? I think that uh, 
there are ways to defend affirmative action that um, are more honest than others. <laughs> and when you're going to not mention affirmative action in your brief and only talk about the Asian discrimination part and say, you know, the basic statistical principles we're not going to uh, somehow don't apply here, then I think there are problems. And I think that there, it leads to problems, period, because in my view, the ruling gives license with a different court for any kind of discrimination. You know, if we're going to say we can have this uh, BS personal rating, and then we can say, oh, you know, when you came up for a job, it wasn't your race. You just weren't likable. And we've got the rating to prove it. And I don't have to justify. There could be massive racial differences in that rating. I don't have to justify it. That's a problem. You know, a different court could interpret that in, in, in very bad ways. You, know, you could have had that ruling go, look, Asian discrimination is not okay. We're still going to think you can have affirmative action, just you can't be penalizing Asian Americans relative to white students. That would have been a fine outcome. That's not what that brief was about, at least in its text. The reason they wrote it may have been about these other, uh, these other reasons. Okay, well, you convinced me that uh, the genie out of the bottle on personal ratings could be a backdoor to all kinds of discrimination if the courts don't rein it in. So this is on appeal, right? It's on appeal. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've come out of it a bit cynical, you know, in the sense that I think what matters more is not necessarily the statistical evidence, but the composition of the court, the leanings of the judge, that you're going to, that the rulings are going to come out um, to fit the, the, whatever the desired policy outcome, not based on the statistical evidence per se. Um, yeah, and that, I, that's what I think is disappointing because I think that if an Asian American group had brought this separate from affirmative action, I don't think economists would have lined up on the other side. I think it would have been a very clear cut case. There have been other things that have come out of this. You know, the fact that the way the legacy and athlete preferences work at Harvard is crazy. You know, 16 per, over 16 percent of white admits are recruited athletes. That's way more than any of the other racial groups. For African Americans, it's a little over eight percent. But it's because the sports that Harvard offers are things like sailing. Yeah, and you can actually see at some places they're getting rid of some of these sports. Stanford removed yeah. 11, 11 sports. Yeah, uh, and these are like automatic admissions, you know. So, it, yeah. Uh, you, you had I had asked you what's another example of where politicization might be a problem. You couldn't think of anything, but I can think of something, and that's the controversy over Roland Fryer's uh, findings of the Houston, Texas data that uh, looking at uh, the use by police officers of lethal force and controlling for the circumstances of the encounter between the citizen and the police officer, he was unable to, to find any racial uh, difference in the likelihood of the police officer's use of lethal force in those encounters. Um, and uh, we, you and I had uh, been talking about this before we started recording the conversation. I wonder if you would, you know... Yeah review what you are thinking about that that controversy and the, that research well so i you know i didn't know Roland fire personally i still don't but when that came out and the way that he talked about the results to me my respect for him just went way up you know not that it wasn't <laughs> i had respect for him before based on his work but what impressed me so much is that he basically said, look, this was not what I was expecting to find. And for you to report the results that uh, go against your priors, go against even maybe what you want to be true, that shows integrity. Uh, and I'm worried about that, you know, for economics as a whole, that only certain answers are going to be acceptable, at least 
in regards to certain certain research topics. Maybe an industrial organization, we're going to be okay, you know, or econometric theory. Uh, but in other places, uh, that's not going to be the not going to be the case. Now you know that the uh, finding that Fryer gets has been uh, criticized by some people on technical grounds. Uh, are you are you following the debate? I mean, uh, I just want people who are listening in to understand. So what Roland does is um, he's got the, the police reports about incidents in which they encounter citizens when um, when a shooting might have occurred, like for example, an arrest. And so he, because he's he wants to estimate the likelihood of a shooting occurred. He doesn't want to simply only use the incidents of shootings. He wants to use encounters where shootings might have occurred. That's a zero. If the shooting occurs, it's a one. And so he can estimate the probability of the shooting occurred. Now, what he finds is that, uh, and, and he very careful in terms of using the handwritten, um, often handwritten uh, incident reports of police officers having his army research assistants go in there with the uh, access from the police department to review these documents and then quote them about the conditions of the encounter and whatnot so that he can have right-hand side variables for this uh, this uh, uh, discrete choice event that he's going to uh, estimate. Uh, people are saying that the denominator of this uh, likelihood composed of encounters that might or might not have led to a shooting is bloated by blacks who are being uh, encountered by the police under circumstances that whites wouldn't have been encountered by the police. They're especially innocuous. So, for example, women the, in the uh, among the blacks are a higher proportion of those in the encounters than they are amongst the whites. That's one indication of this more general observation, which is that the selection equation is working in a way that is more expansive for blacks so that that denominator is bigger than it ought to be if indeed there were no non-discrimination going on. And hence the fraction that you're estimating is smaller for blacks than it is if you properly took this into account. So do you find that credible? I mean, I think that that's one potential bias. I think that there are other biases sort of working in the other direction. Uh, and, and that's what's interesting about it, because Pryor also finds that on non-lethal force, there is discrimination. Now, the approach to discrimination in economics in the past, which has definitely been come under fire recently, is that, you know, you add the controls and you see it going away. It does make you wonder that if you had more controls, would it continue, continue to go away? And the baseline gaps are really large. So it is the case that the controls are doing a lot, a lot in the model, which makes you wonder if you had even more controls, what would happen? But what's interesting about that is th there isn't uh, – you're not going to get pushback on that conclusion in, in today's time. Uh, you're going to get pushback on the, the lethal force conclusion. Uh, and to me, the lethal force I find more credible, which maybe that's going to get me <laughs> into trouble, uh, both because of the selection on observables, unobservables argument, but also because of, uh, what Friar's, Friar's approach to the whole operation, which was, this isn't what he expected to find. And I think, I, I need to look it up again, but I think he had some nice responses on that, on that point. You can never rule out everything, you know, so it's, it, it's not a perfect, nothing's perfect in terms of, of analyzing it. Yeah, well, I don't know. I think we might have covered uh, covered a fair amount of ground. Anything else you want want to bring up before we conclude? You know, I, uh, it's interesting because I, what I like I like to try to approach research fairly detached uh, from what the outcome is. I will say that over the course of the 
Carver stuff. I became more attached on the Asian discrimination case and it was reading the files that, that tipped it over the edge, you know? So, you know, you, you see these negative results against Asian Americans. And then I read the file and, uh, about this one woman in particular, whose dad suffered, you know, a severe mental illness like she writes about. Her and her mom were hit by um, a drunk driver the summer before college, which she writes about. She spent time in foster care, which she writes about. And the reader gives um, her the usual score on the personal rating. Just writes this, a three. Is a, this is an Asian applicant. Asian female applicant, yes. And the only comment on the application is SS, which means standard strong, which means good, but not good enough. There was nothing standard about this person. And it stood in stark contrast to the alumni who also interviewed her. And the alumni were like, this is one of the best interviews they've ever had. I can't believe what this person has overcome in the way she's able to talk about it. I'm sorry, David. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Peter. Who was the uh, first uh, interviewer? Well, so that's the key with this personal rating. The admissions officer gives the personal rating generally without meeting the applicants. Oh, so she the, was reading. He or she were reading the materials and gave a rating. Yes. The alumni actually met the applicant uh, in a yes. personal meeting. Yeah. And and going in, I would have actually expected that it would be the alumni who might be the ones who, who would be more discriminatory. I mean, they haven't had diversity training probably. They're definitely gonna be way more likely to be white. Uh, but the alumni personal rating doesn't show near the trends that what the, how the admissions officers uh, penalize. So the admissions officers have a view of the world then. They, they have an idea about what they're trying to do. Uh, they have a type, or maybe a family of types. And uh, this kid, amongst many other Asian kids, didn't fit the type. That's right. So the thing I find most almost poignant about this, we've been talking almost an hour, you're a fellow of the Econometric Society and write papers about dynamic discrete choice models. And I am who I am, and yet, when I ask you at the end, is there anything you want to say? You told a story. You, you didn't cite a statistic. You talked about a person and you talked about them in, in uh, ways that were emotional and, and powerful. Uh, and there are real stories behind this. And I can imagine people on the other side would be saying yes. And for every story of that kind, there's going to be a student, a black student from, you know, Baltimore or somewhere who has a story that's like that. Um, I do want to ask you something because I'm here at Brown University and we are Brown University. And uh, there are people around here who are very concerned about race and ethnicity who would say something like, economics has got its head up its butt. It's all about quantification and statistics. You're worried about research precision and whatnot. And yet it is it tacitly buying into a view of the world. So for example, we're neoliberal. We think markets are good. We, we like property. We're individualist. We, we, we want to talk about freedom of the person and we, you know, uh, it's a reductive view of society that doesn't see power. We have no place in our theories for anything like that. Everything gets reduced down to the personal qualities of the individual. We don't know about structure and texture and things like that. Um, and I, I think that's a very unfair, that's a bad rap on us. And I think you give evidence uh, as to why it's a bad rap. People don't know. Uh, you're, you're a, a person of uh, powerful uh, uh, faith commitments and uh, have a larger view of the world than just the numbers that might be dancing around in your head. I just want to say that, Peter. I hope I don't embarrass you. Oh, I think I appreciate it, you know. Uh, and I've really been really appreciative of our, of our relationship, uh, which uh, began back with Linda. So uh, it was a wonderful woman you know, who actually sparked my own research interests before you <laughs> uh, was, was Linda's uh, work, 
So, um, yeah. This is uh, my wife, my late wife, Linda Datcher Lowry, uh, who was, uh, when she passed away in 2011, a professor at Tufts University, uh, who Stephen Derloff once called the mother of social capital research and economics, because some of her early papers going back to the late 1970s uh, we're on social network effects and uh, job markets and whether or not matches uh, the quality of the employee employer match, depending on finding it through the network and, you know, stuff about families, grandmothers and grandfathers influence on the grandchildren's educational achievement and things like that. I did not know that she had influenced you, but that's a very pleasant thing to hear you say. Definitely. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I miss her. Yeah. 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 And I think, uh, with my own, you know, my dad passed away when he was 53. So that, uh, that's always made me quite cognizant of, of that and the missing role that, that, you know, they play in your life. Um, he died during yeah. the first year of grad school. So, oh. Nehemiah, uh, Linda, and I have two sons together, Glenn the second, uh, and Nehemiah. Nehemiah was uh, in his junior year at college at Columbia when his mother uh, succumbed to breast cancer after a long struggle. And uh, Glenn was uh, uh, three years older than Nehemiah. Uh, he was home uh, with Linda and me the last year. Uh, of Linda's life and um, they lost their mother quite young. So I guess you can probably identify with that. Uh, she was 59 yeah. years old when she passed away. Uh, she was the first African-American woman to take a PhD in economics from MIT. Uh, she, her first job was at the survey research center at the university of Michigan, where she was working with the panel study of income dynamics data and doing some very innovative stuff. Uh, and she came on uh I dragged her to the East Coast and we took the job at Harvard in the early 1980s. And then she got a uh, position at Tufts. And I'm proud to be able to say there is an endowed uh, uh, award, the Linda Datcher Lowry Award, that's given to the best undergraduate thesis uh, of, of uh, economics uh, concentrators at uh, Tufts University, even to this day. So That's great. <laughs> It's good to be able to remember her. Good to be able to talk to you, Peter. We ought to do it again sometime. Would love to. Thanks a lot for okay. having me. You're welcome. Thanks for coming on The Glenn Show.